All right, everybody, welcome to another application session. I'm John, this is Maggie. This is the brachial plexus that I just took a test on. And today we're gonna to be diving into some psychosocial topics like the memory that helped me learn this. Um, so today we're gonna to be going over all this in the uh, psychosocial chapter two. Um, all the high yield topics. We're gonna to be talking about memory and then kind of the nervous system at large. There's a lot. Yeah, look at that brachial plexus behind John. Look at that brachial um, plexus. Look at that one. Gorgeous. Wow. It's amazing. Um, but we're gonna be talking about neuron structure, action potentials, and then um, the, the organization of the nervous system as far as the peripheral versus the central and then the parasympathetic, all that kind of stuff. So let's go straight into it. So memory, what do you need to know about memory? Um, this figure over here on the left was taken straight from your content guide. And honestly, I couldn't really find a better explanation of the process of remembering something. So you see over here, we get environmental stimuli, okay? It's any, literally anything that ever happens ever. Um, it goes into sensory memory. That's iconic and echoic memory, all right? Oh my gosh, that's the most giant. Giant pen. <laughs> what was I using that for? That, that's what I'm saying, where you're just like, I'm gonna see how fast I can color my whole screen. <laughs> I probably was doing that while I was um, procrastinating filming a video this morning. Okay, so we got iconic and echoic memory. That's the sensory memory, like less than three seconds, right? If you give anything um, attention, um, it turns into short-term memory, so that's less than one minute. Um, if you if you do what's called maintenance rehearsal, which is just like when you're repeating someone's phone number or you're like repeating a number just to yourself so you can memorize it, it just kind of like goes back on top of itself and you just, just kind of keep it in short-term memory. But if you do elaborative rehearsal, which is what we're hoping that you all do with your content guides as you're taking in information that we hope that you're giving it lots of attention and then you're rehearsing it elaborate, elaboratively. You're thinking about it conceptually and, and doing flashcards that test your memory. Then things can go in your long-term memory. Um, if you retrieve the information, then it goes back into your short-term memory. This is a really good time to talk about flashcards and throw some shade, which I never miss an opportunity to do. Um, Maggie, if I were to have a flashcard um, that said blank memory is less than one minute and I looked at the flashcard and I remember like less than one minute short-term memory and that's all I do what type of rehearsal is that maintenance yes so for those of you that are looking at your flashcards and you're just learning them semantically, you know, you kind of remember spatially, oh, well, this is a short flashcard. And the last time I saw a short flashcard, it was maintenance rehearsal. Um, it, you're not doing it consciously, right? But it's subconscious and it's easy. Um, you're studying poorly. You should see that and you should say, oh, blank rehearsal is less than 60 seconds. Okay, well, um, I'm pretty sure that's short-term memory, but what does that mean is more than 60 seconds? Oh, that's long-term memory. Okay, well, what if it's 61 seconds? And, and you know, thinking about all these things around it, and okay, well, how could they test me on this? What's something that I've recently stored in my short-term memory that has not made it to long-term memory? Like, like studying a flashcard should be like an intense process. Um, and, and you do it by asking yourself questions around it because Otherwise, you're just doing maintenance rehearsal. True. Um, and then you can see over here on the right side, um, short term memory, you know, you have sensory memory and then short term memory. And we've kind of drawn this line through it right here. But long term memory has some more distinctions and, um, you know, branches off of it. You can have explicit versus implicit memory, explicit memory. Um, also known as declarative memory, memory kind of branches off into episodic and semantic memory. 
So just know all those different distinctions and kind of how to draw draw the line back up. In fact, if if you, you know, an example of how to elaborately rehearse this is to be able to draw this for memory. Have a card that says draw the memory tree and being able to draw that. Um, that'd be a good thing. John, anything else on this? Yeah, something that's tested frequently on the MCAT is the durations of sensory short-term and long-term memory. And so literature is not very concise on this, and it's because it's it's not like your body cuts off at 60 seconds. It's like, nope, no longer short-term memory. I will remember everything forever if I remember it for 61 seconds. Like that's not how your body works. And so that's why you kind of see some variations between these. But for the MCAT, what, what you pretty commonly see is that sensory memory is less than one second. Short-term memory is less than one minute. Um, and then long-term memory is like one minute to forever. Now they will, whenever they're testing you, they will be very um, explicit about this. So they, they won't give you um, 65 seconds and ask you to split that hair. They won't give you 50 seconds and ask you to split that hair. If it's sensory memory, or I'm sorry, they would give you 50 seconds. That's obviously short term. They won't give you two seconds and ask you to split that hair. But if it's sensory memory, they'll say something like, um, it immediately happened or, or you heard a noise, but you didn't pay it, it much attention. If it's short term memory, they'll be like, you remembered it for 30 seconds or you looked at it for 30 seconds. And if it's long term memory, you'll usually see like really dramatic examples, like either hours or days or, or, or months. Mm -hmm. Agree. Speaking of how they test this, uh, I have a question. That's usual. Okay. Um, let me remember. Okay. So, yeah, I remember this. So, um, you know, the excerpt at the top is from the passage, and it's basically talking about this some way that these researchers tested memory. The whole passage is about memory um, and about how people liked music from their childhood and how they um, how their music evoked feelings and, and blah 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 but you can see um, you know if you want to pause this and read over it and, and try the question on your own then absolutely uh, we would love if you did that but let me just kind of get to what I'm trying to get to in the passage um it says Yeah, so those who reported having personal memories associated with any of the songs were asked whether the memories were from their parents alone with other people. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the emotion that they labeled. Um, so let's look at the question. It says participants who reported personal memories about particular songs were retrieving which type of information? Okay, so these were college age participants and they were re reporting these personal memories associated with listening with their parents alone or other people. Um, obviously, like a long time ago, because these hits were from way back when. Um, so let's let's look through it a little bit. Episodic, episodic memory. What is that? I always think episodic experiences. They both start with E. Um, those are things that have happened to us. They're not they're not facts, they're just like things that have happened in our lives and that's how we're remembering it. Semantic would be like facts. Okay. Implicit memory is like, um, you know, I know how to tie my shoes. I know how to type on the keyboard. I don't have to like think about that. It's almost, it's like automatic memory kind of. Um, but don't get it confused with, um, well, hold on. Yeah, right here. Implicit memory, also known as procedural memory. A lot of people think of, it, think of it as muscle memory. So I'll put that muscle memory. Um, even though it doesn't necessarily have to do with skeletal muscle movement, it's just implicit, it's just procedural, it's just you don't have to think about it. And then sensory memory we talked about was um, iconic and echoic. So in this case, these, these kids are, are these college age people are thinking about these songs that they listened to with their parents when they were five years old. What kind of memory is that gonna be? Episodic. All right. 
That was an experience that they had. John, anything to say about this question? Nope, you nailed it. All right. John, do you want to cover this one? Uh, sure. This looks like it's just talking about figure interpretation. It says, after taking the experimental drug, person A showed an improvement in what? Um, and so this is just going to say which of these is showing a significant improvement. Uh, this is kind of interesting. It doesn't give us any indicators of significance. Um, usually you'll have like asterisks or something giving you in significators of or indicators of significance, but this one doesn't. So you're just going to have to kind of eyeball it and see the one that's really skyrocketing, skyrocketing up. Um, uh, so it says these memory tests were administered before and after taking the drug. So pre-test, I'm assuming, would be before you take the drug. I'm, I'm looking at the graph now. Post-test would be after it. It looks like the one that really went up is person A improved in memories of the event right before the brain injury. So you can see that those black bars, it really, really increased. Um, and so now I'm saying, okay, well, which of these is referencing memory that occurred, uh, memory of events that occurs right before the brain injury? So I might miss this one on live television. Um, <laughs> because I'm struggling to remember anterior grade versus retrograde. So I'm going to start at the bottom then. So short-term memory. Um, short-term memory is something, a, a memory that's going to last for less than 60 seconds or um, not going to last for a long time. So I'll say maybe not to D because we're remembering this for, you know, days, weeks, months after an event. So maybe not. Okay. Semantic memory. Maggie just kind of touched on what that semantic memory would be. Um, does it fit in this box? Really not, because this is more of like an episodic type of memory, right? Because we're looking for something that is um, an experience, or I always thought of as like an episode of TV, because it's an episode of TV is just like a specific moment in time. And so maybe not semantic. And so now I'm looking at interior grade versus retrograde. And so I can tell by the root of the word, interior probably means before. No. Retro is like a throwback thing. So retro would be before the event, and then interior would be after the event. So interior grade would be the formation of new memories, and retrograde would be the recollection of old memories maybe i'm just kind of going <laughs> off my root words and so i would go with b what? and b is the right answer <laughs> that's an excellent ex example of how to get answers correct when you don't know the words <laughs> <laughs> y'all i i do not give john any um indication of what these application sessions are on i pick the questions i make these powerpoints i just literally gave him a figure and he has not studied for the MCAT in like a year or a year and a half, um, but he still was able to rely on his, you know, great application of figure interpretation um, to find out what this figure was about without any passage information. He was also able to mark out things based on, um, you know, things that he knew, obviously, and then things that he didn't know, he kind of broke up into root words. So that was a fantastic example. I just want to brag on John a little bit because that was like, Maybe I should have taken this one because there's absolutely no passage like, <laughs> context. I know whenever you said, John, you want to take this one? I was like, you just throw me to the wolf light, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was over here every time you got something right. I was like, mm -hmm, yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> Dang, I wasn't even looking at you. I was looking into the ether, hoping I could pull answers out of my butt. <laughs> but OK, cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Great job. Yeah, the answer there is retrograde memory. So retro, I like what John said, retro is in the back. Like, you know, you remember something, the 70s were like retro. So retrograde memory would be like before. And then I always think of anterograde when I'm thinking of amnesia, like anterograde amnesia is the inability to make new memories. Antero means like, I guess, forward or something like that. 
Um, that would make sense because interior is on the Ford on the front, right? I don't know. Right. I know that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he knows that one. Um, there we go. That's our memory questions. Now let's talk about the nervous system. Nerves. Nerves. <laughs> What are the big things uh, to know about the nervous system? So this is a picture of a nerve cell or a neuron. What do you need to know about it? You need to know the structure. Uh, nerve cells are some of, are one of the few topics that are really broad. They can be tested in BB, CP, and Psych, and they are, because um, they're really, they have a really good application for like electrophysics. Um, obviously they're in biological systems and then they also explain behavior. So they're across the board got to know them what do you know information comes into the dendrites this is the cell body also called the soma um information propagates along with this thing that's called the axon and then it kind of like spreads out to these synaptic terminals and goes to the next set of dendrites that's how information propagates along an axon or along a, a neuron um, also know a little bit about these blue things which are myelin sheaths know a little bit about um, neural support cells like oligodendrocytes, um, Schwann cells, microglia, know about the myelin sheath. It's a fatty substance that covers axons and it speeds up um, conductivity along the axon. Know about, you know, I'm getting, I'm starting very high yield and going a little bit more low yield as I point out things. So a little bit lower yield of things on a neuron would be like a node of Ranbier. Uh, where, um, what is it called, John, when, what, saltatory conduction, right? Saltatory conduction, they, yep. Yeah, when they kind of skip along the nodes of Rambier because they go so fast over the myelin sheath. So, um, know a little bit about how, I mean, be, I want you to be able to explain to me the direction that nerve impulses move along a neuron. I want you to explain, um, how a an unmyelinated axon would fare against a myelinated axon. Um, I want you to be able to tell me um, what else about a neuron. Um, maybe you know there were a few things that you touched on. You say you should know some stuff about this, but um, like for neural support cells, like oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells specifically, you really just need to know that they're cranking out myelin that they're the ones that are cranking out the myelin. And the difference between those is um, oligodendrocytes crank out myelin in the CNS, right? Mm -hmm. CNS um, and Schwann cells make myelin in the, the peripheral nervous system. I can't say PNS because it's... <laughs> <laughs> but... but um, <laughs> Yeah. It, it, so that's really what you need to know about those. You don't have to go into too much depth about the neural support cells. And, and, I mean, you'll see things like astrocytes on the test in, in a passage, but, but you don't have to have any pre-required knowledge. Um, and so mm -hmm. the, the concept of neurons is, it really is like a mile long, and or, yeah, a mile long and an inch deep. You, you really just kind of need to know what something is and what its primary function is, and that's usually good enough for the neuron. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, it, so oh, and, and just, I'm sorry, real quick, Maggie, just in case, so that you can kind of make it make sense spatially in your body, um, because especially when you learn about something that is in the body, the easiest way to do elaborate rehearsal is to think, huh, how will I need, what does this actually look like in the macro world? Like, what does this look like as far as relates to my future career as a, as a physician? You know? If you think about your nerves, nerves. If you think about your nerves, there, it, one neuron does not make a nerve, and two neurons does not make a nerve. And so a good way to learn kind of get an appreciation for the size of neurons is to look at how you get from a neuron to a nerve. And I'll let you all figure that one out, but it deals with, um, you'll be seeing, you'll be using words like fibrils and fibers and nerves and things like that. Yeah, that is a good way to, to think about how it actually applies to your life and to the world that you can see. 
Uh, so the nervous system, um, you know, the nervous system at large has a lot of different organizational levels and hierarchies. So once you break it down a little bit, you do, I don't, I don't foresee you being asked specific questions about like, what are the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system? But you will be expected to know that sympathetic and parasympathetic are part of the automatic or the auto. Why is it called the automatic? Yeah, I don't know why that's there, but I mean, that, that's like a way that people try to remember it, but it's not called the automatic, it's autonomic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know you know that. Uh, okay, this is called the autonomic. That was just there for you to catch. Yeah, exactly. So um, the nervous system breaks down into the central and peripheral. The central nervous system is your brain and spinal cords. Your peripheral nervous system is all the nerves that branch off of your spinal cord um, and, your, and your brain. Um, so the somatic, the peripheral breaks down further into the somatic and the autonomic. Think somatic, skeletal muscles. Um, and then the autonomic is like smooth, like the innervation of smooth muscles um, and things like that. Once you get down to the autonomic, then it breaks down further into sympathetic and parasympathetic and they have different um, effects as far as you know sympathetic being fight or flight and then parasympathetic being rest and digest so i think that something that was confusing to me when i was thinking about this is like i didn't have a good idea of what it actually meant to be part of a somatic or an autonomic nervous system and like and like why it mattered, I was like, oh, the skeletal muscles, like they're so much more interesting, like we can control them. Why is the autonomic nervous system the one that gets a branch? But really, it is a lot more interesting to look at the autonomic nervous system because that's the one where we can't control what it does. And so it has to go off of our own hormones and our own environmental stimuli to decide what it's gonna do. For instance, if I get into, you know, if I see a saber-toothed tiger, say I'm a caveman, first off, and then I see a saber-toothed tiger. This is making I'm a song a caveman. <laughs> Very important for your understanding. Um, my sympathetic nervous system is going to take over. I don't give a crap about what my skeletal muscles do because honestly, they're probably not going to do much. I'm more of like a freeze kind of person. But, you know, what is going to happen. My irises that I cannot control are going to dilate. My stomach is going to stop like digesting food because it's not important right now. Um, blood is going to rush to my skeletal muscles, like the, the, the muscles in our arteries and veins that actually arteries are the only ones that have muscles, right, John? There's yeah. a very thin the muscles layer that are in my arteries are going to... Very thin layer of smooth muscle around the veins, but nothing that's going to do too much matter yeah, yeah nothing that's going to matter so the muscles that are in my arteries exactly. yeah so um that's the interesting part and and i want you guys to think when you think about the autonomic nervous system think about all those things that you can't control and that your body like your brain has to kind of control for you um that's what the autonomic nervous system is and that's why it gets its own branch and why it's so interesting john Just wanna... it to you. Nothing. No, no. I mean, that's 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 good. I mean, that's that's exactly how I think of it. I mean, fight or flight. The the only thing that the MCAT might test you on a little bit differently is like knowing that fight or flight. It, you think of it as like your adrenaline response, which is like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and the neurotransmitters that are associated with, associated with it. And when you're looking at sympathetic versus parasympathetic, it's really talking about what processes get activated in response to the stimulus. Um, and so whenever we say fight or flight, we mean like you're either going to fight the saber-toothed tiger or you're going to run away from it. Um, or if you're thinking about real, real life now, you get stressed out about a test, you're either going to study for it or you're going to dodge it and go play video games or um, something else. And, and parasympathetic is like you're, you're not in a threatening situation and so 
you're going to rest, recover, rebuild the cells that you want to protect, and then also digest the, the burrito you just ate. But it, it's also, I don't want anybody to think that um, I, not all veins have smooth muscle. Maybe I should just cut that out, but I don't want anybody <laughs> thinking I'm stupid. There's just some, there's some veins that have a very thin layer of smooth muscle. Um, that's not important. That's not on the MCAT. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't know that anyway, but I would say if you're going to be tested on the autonomic nervous system, they will test you on specific uh, reflexes, like the common ones. Eyes, whether they're dilating or constricting. Mm. They dilate when you're sympathetic. They constrict when you're parasympathetic. Uh, the muscles of your digestive system, they are not active in sympathetic and they are in parasympathetic. Um, and there's a couple others. The arterial response is a big one. Yeah. And then so your, your heart muscles... rate, your heart rate yeah. elevates <laughs> in the fight or flight. That's a big one. Salivary. Do they talk much about the salivary glands? They are active in parasympathetic and they're not in sympathetic. Yeah, actually, you're, you're right. Yes, they do talk about that because it's, it's one of the weird ones. Because you always, yeah. a lot of people make the assumption that like sympathetic turns everything on. That's not true. Yeah. Good. Yeah, exactly. I think that's. I want to say there's more, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely more symptoms, but um, I think they get the point. John, I think I think you can definitely. If you did that other one, you can definitely do this one with very little okay, cool. passage context. <laughs> At the time of the car accident, okay. which component of the nervous system of person A and B was not activated? Let me go back and read about it. Oh, person A and B. Um, they got drugged. I'm assuming this is after. Um, and they experienced brain injuries in car accidents. Person A was initially in a coma. Okay, so this is just saying we got two cat daddies, uh, maybe a cat lady, in a car accident. And we're going to say which of these was not activated. Okay. A would be sympathetic nervous system. If you're in a car accident, you're going to be kind of freaked out. You got a little fight or flight going on there, right? You got some of that adrenaline rushing. You got, it's an experience that's going to make your heart beat quickly. And so that's usually sympathetic nervous system. So I'd say maybe not A. B, parasympathetic nervous system. I could see this not being activated, right? Like I, I very rarely have I been in a car accident and been like, you know what? I need to make sure that my breakfast is getting digested. Like, let me just put some effort into that real quick. You know, so I, I'd say maybe not parasympathetic, but a car accident doesn't sound very rest and digesty. So I kind of like, I kind of like be, I'd say maybe. C is your peripheral nervous system. Okay, that's talking about the all of the um, nerves nerves that are outside of your brain and your spinal cord. So things that will innervate your arms and your hands and the brachial plexus that goes to your upper extremity and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's going to be activated, right? Because you've got to have time to like freak out. I don't know how people look when they have a wreck. You know, kind of like freak out and clench the wheel or like, I don't know, maybe you throw your hands up to protect yourself from the airbag or whatever. So uh, I think that would be still be activated. You don't get in a car wreck and your body's just like, man, let's let's call it quits in advance. And then I'll kind of rule out D too, right? Like your brain and your spinal cord don't stop working just because you are in the middle of a car accident. So I would stick with B, parasympathetic nervous system. Perfect. You also think if your sympathetic nervous system is going to be active, which we already talked about heart rate increasing, getting scared, blah, 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 then your peripheral nervous system is activated because the, the sympathetic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system. So John, very good job. It is B. Thanks, Max. All right. Um, so the next thing that I think is pretty high yield about the nervous system is an action potential. Um, when, I, when, I, when I was talking about the structure of a neuron earlier, um, I was considering talking about an action potential because it does happen at the axon of, um, of a neuron. 
But when when you think of action potentials, I want you guys to know a pretty good bit about it. I want you to know what the resting membrane potential is. Um, normally people say about negative 70. So that's re relative to the outside of the axon. The inside of the axon is a little bit more negative. It's about negative 70 millivolts less than the outside. Uh, so that's where we're resting. When an action potential gets propagated along an axon, what's the first thing that happens? Um, sodium channels are opened, voltage gated sodium channels. And so positive charges are going to rush into the axon due to, um, you know, concentration differences and diffusion and all those good rules. And that's why um, nerves are so brought up so often in the CP sections because it has to do with like electrochemical gradients and stuff as far as how an action potential works. But anyway, positive charges are going to rush in, making the inside of the axon more positive. So we see an increase in the voltage. Um, once it gets to the top, actually, um, I'm not sure that I love this. Uh, I don't love this, this figure that I've gotten, to be honest. Because I always learned that right here is where potassium channels open, letting out potassium. So um, they do that because once you get to a certain, they're voltage gated. So um, once you get to a certain voltage, then the potassium channels open, they let out potassium, and then that, that kind of starts to drop the charge again because you're letting out a positive charge and then um, around the same time i always learn kind of right at the top is where the um, sodium channels close and so they stop letting in positive charge and they keep letting out those potassium ions and so the charge is going to drop and it actually ends up dropping below the original threshold it's kind of like those potassium channels are a little bit slow to close um, so they, they, they kind of actually go beneath the resting membrane potential and go a little bit lower, about negative 90, um, before they kind of, it's called hyperpolarization. And then they kind of like even back out and they get ready for the next action potential to happen. John, how do you see this tested on the MCAT? The, the numbers are tested a lot like the resting potential being negative 70, and then the, um, I've made a joke about it so often that I can't remember. Oh, threshold potential. Threshold potential is tested a lot. I, I always call it the point of no return, and I make a joke about it so often that I almost called it that, but um, threshold potential is, I believe it's negative 55 millivolts, right? Yeah. Okay, that's a number. You need to write that down. You, that needs to be a flashcard. What, what is the threshold potential of a neuron? Now the threshold potential is, means that if I get more positive than this number, then it will trigger the voltage gated channels around it to open. Okay, so just think I need, you know, normally my voltage is negative 65 and my voltage gated channels open at negative 55. If I get to negative 60, they don't give an F, right? They're like, I don't care. I don't care, I only like negative 55. That's my thing, I got one little bugaboo and it's negative 55. <laughs> and so once they hit that, then they're like, all right, well, we, we, we can do this. We can do this thing if you want. And so um, that's that's tested often. And then I, everything that you, you referenced as far as like closing the sodium channels and, and potassium channels, I have seen, um, that tested fairly frequently. And then another thing that I've seen tested on a couple exams is um, what restores the resting potential once you're at hyperpolarization. Do you know what it is, Moogs? Mm. So you yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that restores um, resting potential um, and then if just kind of some added things to help it make sense is um, as far as fluctuations 
if we're looking at the left side of this graph and you're at a resting membrane potential and you're wondering like, well, how in the world do we get up to um, negative 55? Like what just makes it decide, all right, I'm, I'm gonna send it. And, and there, it, it, it's different in every cell, uh, or not in every cell, but there's, there's multiple different mechanisms to do this. Some of them are voltage, or I'm sorry, some of them are um, like mechanically gated channels those would be your sensory neurons take your finger and poke your other finger you feel how you are getting poked those are those are mechanically gated neurons meaning if they get um, compressed or they feel a mechanical force they are going to open up and they're gonna allow just a little bit of just a little sodium here a little sodium there and then there's some that are like chemically gated ones and those are going to be like in your nostril and stuff like that. And so whenever you smell something, it's because this chemical that is the odor is going to bind the chemically gated channel. It's going to allow some sodium in and it's going to send it. Um, and so it, that, that kind of helps me make, make help thing, helps things make more sense to me is to understand Okay, how are these things actually changing? And if you want to put it into context of other things like the just noticeable difference, have you ever wondered like, why can I lick somebody's elbow when they're not looking and they don't feel it? It's because you're not getting to negative 55 millivolts. So you may be getting to negative 60, but you're not getting to negative 55. Maybe I'm the only one that licks people's elbows. They told me I had to stop or they were gonna kick me out, but here I am, a licking elbows. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pandemic. Yeah, that's my little bugaboo. <laughs> it's a oh. pandemic. That's how we greet other people, right? Yeah. It's a... I'm John. Hi. Um, but the the cardiac system, the cardiac action potential is really it, it. It would be past the MCAT, but it's really really interesting to see how things like the hyperpolarization and like the slow closing of the of the potassium channel are actually beneficial. They actually help with your pumping rhythm. All right. Next thing about the nervous system that I think is important is the last thing um, would be like the lobes of the brain and the brain anatomy and how it relates to uh, behavior. So um, know the, the lobes. You got your frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe. Um, what else do you need to know? You need to know, um, where's my pen right here? Some things in the, um, like in the limbic system, you need to know the hypothalamus, the thalamus. Um, and what do, I, what do I mean when I say you need to know them? I mean, you need to know the, um, the behaviors that they're associated with or the functions that they have within the brain. Um, I would say also know a little bit about the medulla. It has, it, it, the medulla deals with, um, making you breathe, making your heart beat, um, some really, really basic brainstem type functions. Also makes um, alligators angry. Yeah. <laughs> in large because they got all those teeth in their toothbrush. That's right. Um, but also know the cerebellum, it has to do with, with posture and um, coordination of our, of our motor, um, of our motor reflexes. But there's a few more that are not listed here. Um, and there's some that I don't care what, I don't know, I don't care if you know anything about anything about the ventricles. Um, I don't care the cerebellar cortex. No, I don't care. Um, the central sulcus or the central gyrus or whatever, don't care. The cerebral cortex just refers to like the wrinkly part of our brain. And so it doesn't necessarily have like, I mean, I guess it does have a function like higher thought, but um, I want you guys to know anything that's in your content guide, whether you're with us and with our program or you're with another program, I want you to know the functions of those, um, of those brain structures because they are pretty high yield in psychosocial and sometimes even in the BB. Um, so yeah. And they're just free points. Like they're, they're straightforward. There's some of the few questions that are straightforward. I mean, you will see something that's like, which of these does the thalamus do? Yeah. Can't miss that question. Huh? Can't 
can't miss that question. Yeah. And there are like, I would say key words that you need to know for each one, like thalamus, sensory relay, like that's how they're going to ask it. Yeah. You know, sure. um, temporal lobe, hearing and memory, like occipital lobe vision. That's how they're going to ask it. Um, so know those keywords that go with each part of your brain. Okay. Um, I think I got two questions here, so I'll do both of them. This one says, while person A was in a coma, researchers considered stimulating her brain to bring her out of her coma, comatose state. The researchers most likely have stimulated the... All right, so all of these answer choices, you guys should know what they are going into the MCAT. Uh, Wernicke's area has to do with speech. Um, specifically speech comprehension. Um, Wernicke's and Broca's area are the two parts of your brain that deal with speech. Um, Broca's is with the actual production of speech and then Wernicke's is with the comprehension of, of words and how they fit together. That's probably not going to bring someone out of a comatose state. Parietal lobes. Um, those, when I think of that, I think of like the somatosensory um, cortex. And I can see that D is the somatosensory cortex. So B and D are referring to similar areas in the brain. And neither one of them are the right answer. Because to, to stimulate my somatosensory cortex would mean like if you stuck a probe in my brain and stimulate my somatosensory cortex, I might feel a pain in my arm. Or like I might feel like my foot is moving. But that would not bring me out of a coma. You know what would? Maybe. I don't, I don't actually know, I've never seen it, but if someone um, stimulated my RAS or my reticular activating system, um, that has to do with um, what state of consciousness that you're in and, and making sure that you, you are, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like arousal or like, like just general arousal, um, general attention, uh, things like that. John, anything? Mm -mm. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, this one's a little bit more difficult, um, but this is what I'm saying when you have to know like keywords that go with um, different parts of the brain. So it says researchers using animal models indicate cocaine exposure during pregnancy reduces oxygen levels and blood flow to the uterus, interferes with neural proliferation and synaptogenesis, alters functioning of three neurotransmitters in the offspring during gestation and thereafter impairs post-weaning discrimination, learning and attention skills. This says in mammals, which brain area is least involved with the abilities mentioned in the first paragraph. So I'm thinking about the abilities mentioned in the first paragraph right here in the last sentence. And I want to mark out anything that has something to do with that. So the frontal lobe. Yes, very much so. The frontal lobe deals with um, learning and that really, um, th when you think about the frontal lobe, think about the things that make humans different from animals. Um, you know, speech is there. Uh, like that's where Broca's area is. That's where the we like- soul. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's in the frontal lobe. <laughs> uh, Coco has a soul and she definitely has very little brain mass period so she stole that from her last victim though <laughs> <laughs> so definitely not that one because Rita does have something to do with the abilities in the first paragraph hippocampus has to do with memory um, and learning is very closely tied with memory so that's probably not the right answer and you can see i accidentally um clicked one of these answers and then had to click another answer because I forgot to screenshot it before I chose the answer. Anyway, that's why the last two were purple. Uh, C says the hypothalamus. So when I think of the hypothalamus, I think of the endocrine system and how it is closely tied with the pituitary gland. That's not really um, having to do with learning or attention. So I'm thinking maybe on that one. The thalamus has to do with sensory relay. It also has a little bit to do with um, like, like attention type stuff. Um, you know, and I mentioned thalamus sensory relay, but like learning and 
discrimination learning, especially, um, that would be like being able to tell two things apart. That would require some sort of like understanding of, of incoming stimuli. And so I would have a 50-50 between C and D, but ultimately C is just so closely tied to the endocrine system. It really doesn't have anything to do with my learning or attention. All right, and that's the last question. Oh, I gotta stop sharing. All right, everyone, thanks for hanging out. I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs>